During the 17th century, the European countries were all competing for expansion. The Tokugawa shogunate of Japan decided the best way of avoiding Europe was to turn all the lights off and pretend they weren't in. Beginning in 1603, Japan was ruled by a military dictatorship founded by Tokugawa Ieyasu. This period is known as the Edo, or Tokugawa period. In an attempt to maintain stability, the social order was frozen into classes, with mobility between the classes strictly forbidden. Around 80% of the population were peasants who were forced to engage in agriculture to provide a stable source of income for the upper classes. Approximately 40% of the farmer's rice harvest had to be given as taxes to the lords. Another threat to the political stability of Japan was the powers of the West. Japan had suffered through a long period in which the states were at war, known as Sengoku. This period of civil war and unrest lasted from around 1467 to 1615. The shogun believed that this was due to the introduction of Christianity by the Portuguese, as well as other foreign influences. Around 1633, the feudal Japanese military government saw the real possibility that Europe might try to colonize Japan. Spain and Portugal posed the biggest threat, bringing Christianity and colonial influence with them. They decided to take drastic measures to repel the European powers and closed Japan. The policy of Sakoku, meaning chained or locked country, meant that a death penalty awaited any Japanese who had contact with the outside world and very few foreign nationals were permitted trade rights. Japan controlled trade by only allowing specific points of entry into the country. In 1634, they created an artificial island just off the coast of Nagasaki to allow for some foreign trade. The island was named Dejima, or Exit Island. One of the only European nations allowed to trade with the Japanese was the Dutch. Instead of bringing religion and firearms, the Dutch only dealt in goods. The Dutch cemented their relationship with the Japanese government when, during the Shimabara Rebellion of 1637-38, the Dutch sent a gunboat to destroy the rebel stronghold. The Shimabara Rebellion was an uprising of Japanese peasants who were dissatisfied with the heavy taxation and local officials' abuses. As the majority of the peasants in the area had been converted to Catholicism by Spanish and Portuguese missionaries, the rebellion soon took on religious overtones. The rebels were supported by the ronin, masterless samurai warriors whose lords had been dispossessed, and the Japanese government could only quell them with the help of the Dutch. This incident reinforced the government's belief that Christian ideas were the root cause of the unrest in the country, and pretty much put an end to the Japanese Christian movement in the 17th century. From 1641 onwards, only the Dutch and Chinese were allowed to trade through Dejima and only a limited number of Japanese had access to this trade port. But other places in Japan allowed limited trade with other nations. The lords of the So clan of Tsushima traded with the Joseon dynasty of Korea. The Matsume domain was located in Izo, modern-day Hokkaido, and allowed trade relations with the Ainu people who lived on the surrounding Japanese islands. The Ryukyu kingdom to the south was able to trade with Japan. The Tokugawa shogunate enforced a strict social hierarchy. At the top was the emperor, although he was more of a figurehead and, while respected, was practically powerless. Under the emperor were 140 courtly families. These families lived in a bubble of wealth and privilege and were generally unaware of the plight of the peasant population. The true power in Japan was in the hands of the shogun. Underneath them were the daimyo, feudal lords that ruled the clan lands. Each daimyo was required to spend half their time in their region and the other half attending the shogun in Edo, modern-day Tokyo. This move was strategic, as forcing the daimyo to maintain two houses and travel to and from Edo was costly and time-consuming. This extra expense meant the daimyo wouldn't have any spare finances with which to stage a coup. The samurai were a class of their own, a warrior elite who were literate and educated but entirely dedicated to their lord. Peasant farmers were on the next rung down the social ladder. They were poor, but their rice taxes paid for the extravagant lifestyles of the samurai and the noble families. This inequality led to many revolts, but as in any feudal society, the peasants were there to be exploited and had no chance of improving their station. The lowest classes were the artisans and the merchants. Since they did not produce food and therefore paid no rice tax, 
they were deemed pretty useless by the ruling classes. If you were lucky, perhaps you were a swordsmith for a high-ranking samurai, or your pottery caught the eye of a daimyo. The merchants were seen as even lower than the artisans, as they produced nothing at all. However, they did drive economic progress. Even as their wealth grew, their status did not, which prompted them to create their own culture, customs, and hierarchy. The lowest of the low in Japanese culture was the Ita and the Hainan, the non-humans. The Ita dealt with the killing and butchering of animals, and their low status came from the Shinto and Buddhist beliefs against the slaughter of animals. The Hainan were the beggars, lower guards, and anyone on the outskirts of society. Some were exempt from the class system, including the geisha, the actors, and the prostitutes. Since they entertained the nobility, they lived outside the hierarchy. This did not necessarily mean that life was easy for them. Prostitutes were often subjected to cruel treatment and lived as though imprisoned. During Sokoku, Japanese ships were forbidden to leave for foreign countries, and no Japanese were permitted to travel abroad. If any Japanese ship attempted a foreign trip, the travelers would be executed, the ship impounded, and the ship's owner arrested. Any Japanese living abroad would be put to death if they returned home. In addition, any permitted incoming ships would be thoroughly searched for Catholics or Christians wanting to preach. If they were found, they would be tortured into renouncing their religion or were killed. But the shoguns were not all bad. They were surprisingly ecological and years ahead of their time regarding environmental issues. Increased demand for timber had led to deforestation, which resulted in soil erosion, floods, and forest fires, much as it still does today. In 1666, the shogun created a policy to increase the planting of trees and limit logging. By the 18th century, Japan had scientific and detailed knowledge about plantation forestry and silviculture. Japan underwent mass urbanization, with the capital of Edo growing from a fishing village to the world's largest city in around 150 years. The national economy expanded, supported by the agricultural production of the peasants. Other urban centers sprung up in Osaka and Kyoto. By the middle of the 18th century, Edo had more than 1 million inhabitants, and the populations of Osaka and Kyoto exceeded 400,000. Craft and trade bloomed in these new cities, and merchants and tradespeople started to make money, literally. Currency came into common use, and they invented credit instruments to transfer money. In contrast, the finances of the daimyo and samurai began to wane as their primary source of income was a fixed sum linked to agricultural production. With the boom in artisan products, this stipend had not kept up with the other sectors. The final years of the Tokugawa shogunate rule were riddled with financial issues, samurai unrest, and peasant uprisings. This instability ultimately contributed to the end of Sokoku. Plenty of stories of shipwrecked fishermen come from around this time. One of the most famous is that of Manjiro. In 1841, at the age of 14, Manjiro joined a fishing crew which was subsequently caught in a storm and shipwrecked on Torishima Island off the east coast of Japan. Living off the sparse food available to them on the island, supplemented with whatever they could catch in the ocean, the group survived for six months before the crew of the American whaling ship John Howland landed, looking for fresh water. The Japanese fishermen were instantly afraid of these large foreign men. They were unable to communicate with them, but must have known that any contact would lead them to execution if they returned to Japan. The sailors, seeing these emancipated men, one of whom was injured, brought them on board their ship, fed and clothed them. The stranded men were able to communicate that they were from Japan with gestures and signs. Knowing of Japan's policy of isolation, the whaling crew understood that if these men returned home, they would surely be put to death. The whaling crew, led by Captain Whitfield, took the men to Hawaii, where four stayed. Minjiro, being the youngest, was offered the chance to accompany Captain Whitfield to the USA to receive an education. Manjiro had access to an education that would have been denied him in his native Japan due to his status. He even learned to ride a horse, an activity reserved for samurai and officials in Japan. But for nearly 10 years, Manjiro dreamed of the day he might be able to see his mother again. In 1850, he returned to Hawaii and found his fellow countrymen. He wanted to go home. In December, they boarded a ship destined for China with the plan of lowering a small boat into the waters off the coast of Japan and rowing to shore. They did not know what would await them, and despite the very real threat of death hanging over them, 
they were back on Japanese shores by January 1851. They were taken into custody and interrogated, but luckily for them, the Japanese government recognized the value of their information about the outside world. On October 5th, Manjiro was able to see his mother again, but before long, he was summoned to Kochi to teach English to the samurai. A few years later, his skills in English led to his appointment as a samurai, and he was allowed to take a second name. In honor of his home village of Nakanohama, he became Nakahama Manjiro. In 1853, U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry sailed to Japan, determined to force the country into diplomatic and trade relations with the West. Europe was all over Asia at the time, and 10 years earlier, the British had established Hong Kong Island as a crown colony after their first war to stop the Chinese from putting an end to their lucrative opium trade. Perry thought that a display of superior naval power, combined with a resolute attitude, would end the Japanese's policy of isolation. At the beginning of July 1853, he took four ships and sailed into the fortified harbor of Uraga. He refused to leave until a suitable person accepted documents from him and threatened to deliver them by force if they were not received. The Japanese forces were unable to repel him, and so they eventually accepted the letter from the President of the United States. The letter requested a treaty, and the Japanese, fully aware of China's defeat, accepted the terms in an attempt to buy more time while they improved their defenses. In February 1854, Perry returned, sailing into Edo Bay with nine ships. By March 31st, the Treaty of Kanagawa was agreed upon, assuring better treatment of shipwrecked seamen, permission for U.S. ships to dock into two minor ports for fuel and supplies, and a U.S. consul at Shimoda. The treaty was negotiated with the help of Nakahama Manjiro. These events demonstrated that the shogun could no longer enforce the traditional isolationist policies. The Treaty of Kangawa paved the way for more treaties, contributed to the collapse of the shogunate, and led to the modernization of Japan. The Sokoku period of isolation was detrimental to Japan in terms of technology, which lagged compared to the West during this time. Culturally, however, this time of isolation may have saved Japan's unique features. Many of the cultural elements still associated with Japan today originate from the period of Sakoku. Haiku poetry, woodblock print, the tea ceremony, kabuki drama, bonsai tree cultivation, and traditional Japanese landscape gardening are all dated to this period. It is fair to say that Japan did not take long to gain the technological advances of the West. But perhaps the period of isolation enabled it to hang on to the traditions that may have been lost without it. To learn more about the isolation of Japan, check out our book, The History of Japan, a captivating guide to Japanese history, including events such as the Genpei War, Mongol invasions, Battle of Tsushima, and atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.